Good morning. I'm Al Charbonneau, the Executive Director of the Rhode Island Business Group on Health. Thank you for joining us uh, in this important employer discussion, how to manage the post-COVID explosion, explosion in medical spending. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors who support our RIBGH's work, including this morning's discussion. I know I speak on behalf of the RIBGH board and our members when I say we are truly grateful to our platinum sponsor, MRSA, our gold sponsors, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Rhode Island, Hillburg, New England, United Healthcare, Neighborhood Health Plan, Tufts Health Plan, and Aetna. Our silver sponsors, USI Insurance Services, Merck, Gallagher, and Delta Dental. And finally, and last but not least, our RIBGH members, a growing group of over 90 plus companies representing more than 80,000 employees here in Rhode Island. I also know I speak on behalf of the board when I say thank you to the RIBGH Health and Productivity Committee that is responsible for today's event. The H&P Committee is co-chaired by Robin Bouvier from Aon and Jean Tapley from Amica Insurance. I also want to thank Joanne Bellotta and Erica Collins for organizing today's event. It is my pleasure to introduce Robin Bouvier, Vice President health transformation for Aon and co-chair of the H&P committee. Robin will introduce today's speaker, Al Lewis. Thanks, Al, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. As you know, our Health and Productivity Committee organizes our annual Wellbeing Summit, which this year has taken place in a series of four webinars. We started earlier in the year uh, when Dr. Ray Fabius came and talked to us about the impact of COVID. We followed with Cassie Sobleton, who talked about how you could create an exceptional experience for your employees as you're welcoming them back to the workplace. Um, our third series was a recovery-friendly workplace, which is helping people thrive. And the final series is being conducted today, which is really around optimizing healthcare outcomes. Um, I'm going to be introducing your speaker in just a moment. Um, but the role in this particular session is to help you prepare for your upcoming renewal and help you to engage your employee population in being better healthcare consumers and taking better care of themselves. We know that there will be future waves of this pandemic and potentially others. And so it is critically important that we help to keep people as healthy as possible across the state. And the Rhode Island Business Group on Health is committed to partner with you, both in keeping employees healthy and trying to get the best healthcare value that we can for your dollar. If you or a member of your organization would like to join the Health and Productivity Committee, please feel free to reach out to me. Again, my name is Robin Bouvier from Aon or Jean Tapley from Amica, and we'd be happy to have you participate in our upcoming sessions. Uh, we'll be taking the summer off, so you won't see any more webinars from us until after Labor Day, but we will look forward to welcoming you back then. So a couple of logistics this morning. Um, there will be a quiz at the very end of the presentation you should have received an email this morning from Joanne Bellotta. If you'd like, you can go ahead and download the information from that email so you can participate in the quiz. Or as we get to the end of the session, you can access it at that time. But you will need to access the link through that email in order to participate in the quiz. And what's in it for you is the chance to win a $50 gift card. There will be three random winners chosen from those who score highest. So we hope you'll stick around and participate in the quiz at the end. Um, in the meantime, it is my pleasure to welcome and thank Al Lewis for participating in our event today. Um, Al has a, an amazing background. Uh, when I first saw him speak, he was talking about how wellness programs don't work. And so I loved his disruptive point of view, which very closely matches my own, um, that you've got to do things differently if you want to get better results. Um, he has an amazing background that was featured in the invitation for our session today. But the skill set that we're really focusing on during our session today is his role as founder and chief quizmeister at Quizify. And so Al is going to create an interactive experience for us today, helping you to appreciate not only how you can engage your employees in being better consumers and leverage resources like Choosing Wisely, but also help you to appreciate what that experience might feel like if you were to operationalize this approach as a way to communicate with and educate your employees on health. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Al, who is going to share his screen. So thanks, Al. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, oh, one other thing besides winning the money at the end is um, uh, folks should submit their questions along the way because 
when we're doing the polling feature, there's going to be a little bit of dead time, and we'd love to be able to address some questions during the polls. So as Robin mentioned, what we're doing here is uh, there's going to be a lot more healthcare coming in as people are no longer afraid of going to the doctor. It, it, uh, explosion may be a very strong word, but uh, there's a lot of money that, that is left on the table by the providers, and um, I think a lot of them are going to want to get it back. So it's important for employees to know that just because it's healthcare doesn't mean it's good for you. You shouldn't be rushing to the doctor to do things that, um, that don't need to be done. So what are we going to do here? Well, uh, we're going to give you some background on the so-called coming explosion that we talked about. This explosion could easily include inappropriate care. You can educate employees on avoiding that care by uh, choosing wise, by helping them to choose wisely. And we're going to play an employee education game today live using the polling feature to identify sources of inappropriate care to avoid largely using uh, choosing wisely and essentially and making choosing wisely accessible to employees. And finally, at the end, as Robin said, we're going to have this real time 10 minute healthcare quiz for cash prizes. Uh, and you have the link. Okay, the coming explosion. I've got uh, some uh, quotes here for you. Most doctors and hospitals want to return to pre pandemic levels from a sudden decline. Uh, there's going to be a post COVID imaging surge. Three ways imaging leaders can prepare for increased volume, dot, 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 dot. And here's my favorite one. This is from the imaging lobbying group. Now remember, a lot of these imaging folks are owned by private equity companies and they've got profit uh, goals to hit. Uh, imaging volumes have experienced a steep decline. Outpatient volumes have fallen by a whopping 88%. That means they have to get that back and then some. Now, many images are appropriate, we're going to help you show how choosing wisely uh, identifies the inappropriate ones. To give you an idea of how many images there are in the first place, this is the United States versus the rest of the developed world in imaging. Now, this is from 2013. It's actually gone up quite a bit since then. I, I use the 2013 numbers because the, the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation Development, presented them very well. They're essentially inscrutable now but they've gone up since 2013. So as you can see in CAT scans, we are double the international average, which is in red. And uh, you recall we didn't do very well in the Winter Olympics last time, but if, if CAT scans had been an event, we would have run away with the gold here. I mean, we're 20% higher than the next highest uh, country. And MRIs, we're only number two, but there's literally not a list in the world where Turkey is number one, where you wanna be number two. This is the statistics, and here are the folks talking about the statistics. You've got consumer reports talking about the ridiculous number of tests that people get. Um, you've got Atul Gawande, who's probably the best read person in this category, saying that virtually um, the, the host has spotlight. Oh, good, thank you. Spotlight in my video for everyone. <laughs> virtually every family in the country has been over-tested and over-treated. These costs take thousands out of every paycheck every year. Millions receive drugs, operations, and scans that aren't going to make them better and often cause harm. And your job and choosing wisely's job and our job is to cut that number way down. So here's how you avoid the, uh, the explosion. Now choosing wisely is largely aimed at the physician community. It's up to you to translate choosing wisely into something that employees can use. And you can do that by making learning healthcare education, choosing wisely fun. And we're going to use some Quizify examples to show you exactly how to do that. Now, before we get started, uh, you can, as soon as this session ends, you can actually download the choosing wisely questions right into your very own Apple wallet. Okay, you can have them with you when you go to the doctor. You and all your employees can just go to this link, and anybody who wants a presentation with the links, just write to me and ask for it, and you, you can have it. And click on the link, and it will take you to a place where you can literally just put them into your Apple Wallet so you always have them. And on the left side is, uh, I'm sorry, I don't use Citizens Bank, which I know is a Rhode Island bank, but it's Bank of America. But if it's any consolation, I don't really like Bank of America, so I have Citizens. I have my uh, iPhone loan with Citizens, and they're wonderful folks. Um, I have the, you can see the 
Humira for my father, I have that. Scan questions, doctor questions, and a, and a, a billing consent to prevent surprise billing, all right in my very own Apple wallet. So a uh, 30 second shameless plug on how Quizify works and you're gonna uh, experience it yourself, but typically employees will take 12, question, 12 quizzes a year with 10 questions quiz. Most of them will be sort of choosing wisely, nutrition, lifestyle related. Um, you might wanna write a few of your own about benefits and I'll show you an example. Um, we have a points program, but you may have a points program. We can do either one uh, to track the scores. Employees gain the knowledge and they make the healthier decisions. So um, our stuff is um, reviewed by doctors at Harvard Medical School. So you can actually see the label, the Harvard Medical School label right here on our material. So that's the, that takes care of the, wait a second, where are you getting your information thing from? So it tends to, tends to be quite credible. And the way we translated it is that into material is that my personal background is in trivia, um, actually besides being in healthcare. And I, I, I wrote a best-selling trivia game um, produced by Cross Pen, I might add. And uh, this is me, uh, actually like every other trivia buff who needs a life, I was on Jeopardy once, there I am. Um, sometimes people ask me if I won and I reply, well, let me repeat, uh, I was on Jeopardy once. <laughs> so uh, the economics of choosing wisely, the more you know, the less you spend. And this is government data and it shows the folks who understand health literacy on the blue side all the way to people who don't understand it at all. So I'm gonna, I said I would give you, I said that a few, occasionally people would write their own questions uh, and we have templates to do that. And let me show you a sample. Um, let's talk about EAPs. So EAPs, number one, they're, they're very important these days. What with uh, all the mental health issues caused by COVID. But a, a lot of employees, including I might add um, my very own wife. I mean, I'm the quizmeister in chief. And uh, my very own wife did not know that her employer had an EAP. When I asked her, her response was, what's an EAP? So, so you got a lot of teaching to do here. So we have a ton of questions on EAPs that you can customize. Uh, so it says, you have access to an EAP, what is that? And there's the correct answer, choice A. Uh, choice B is, is it the Elvis Aaron Presley diet consisting of peanut butter, bacon, and banana sandwiches? Or choice C for what it stands for is the Edgar Allan Poe diet consisting of raven, but just one serving, never more. Okay, now you see how the game is played. Now we're gonna play the game. Now this is where it gets interesting because we have to coordinate the polling feature together. And also please submit your questions because we're gonna have a little time uh, while the questions are taking place. Well, I'm sorry, while the polling is taking place to answer questions. So question number one, so get your buzzers ready here. Um, let's see if you can do a better job on these questions than, uh, and, uh, than I did with Alex Trebek, which is pretty low bar, I have to say. So the most popular heartburn drugs are Prilosec, Prevacid, and Nexium. What is true about their regular daily long-term use? A, you should continue, you should take them on a daily basis for them to continue working. Now, I, by the way, I can't see the polling questions. Oh yeah, there you go. Okay, so what you're seeing on the screen is now repeated on the polling question. B, long-term use can lead to flatulence. C, there are suspected long-term adverse effects not listed on the label like heart attacks, kidney problems, and fractures, or D, all of the above. So while we're um, waiting for the polling results, have any questions come in, Robin, or do you have any? Well, I would like to first mention that the host and the panelists cannot vote. So this is not a rigged quiz. So for those of you who, who are participating, um, you've got a pretty good chance of winning because the folks behind the scenes are not going to be um, skewing the results. So I will first mention that there haven't yet been any questions from the audience. I would ask, Al, if you could give somebody advice on maybe a way to prevent heartburn. Um, what might you suggest other than taking medication? Uh, that's, that's a great question. We actually have an entire quiz on how to prevent heartburn. So I'm going to give you the most non-obvious thing, which I might, by the way, I do myself, and I was going to turn the whole thing around so you could actually see it. But if you take your bed, if you get nighttime heartburn, you take your bed, which is now flat, you stick a few books 
under the, the headboard, uh, feet of the headboard there, and you tilt your bed at an eight degree angle, it should dramatically reduce your amount of night, night, nighttime heartburn. Awesome. At no cost. Oh, we have answers. Okay, so uh, this we, the answer th that is the most popular is that there are suspected long-term effects not listed on the label, which is absolutely correct. Okay, so I'm going to close this. And we got some all of the aboves. Now, it can't be all of the above because, um, the, because A is very specifically wrong. A got a few votes. A is very specifically wrong. If you actually read the label, which, of course, nobody ever does, it says, do not use this. Do not use these for more than, depending on what, which one you have, two, three, four weeks in a row. And then you discontinue for X number of months before you start reusing. So that rules out A, and that rules out D. Now, as for B, you know, uh, I I'll just tell you my strategy is to blame the dog. Okay, so um, I, that works as well as the heartburn remedy, let me tell you. So it's not just us saying this. You can easily go to the internet and Google on long-term effects of uh, heartburn drugs or long-term effects of they're called proton pump inhibitors and you will find all sorts of stuff. Here's what pops up on the first page. Considerations long-term use, review of emerging concerns, research evaluates possible link to proton pump inhibitor risks, and then my favorite one is eight more reasons to avoid proton pump inhibitors. Now mind you, you don't have to avoid them altogether, you just have to read the label. It very clearly says two weeks and out. Okay, next question, and you can uh, post this. Um, what surgery did 99% of surgeons who do these surgeries say they would never get? Spine, bariatric, facelift, or liposuction? And uh, have we gotten any uh, questions in? Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I don't see oh. anything in the Q&A yet. Okay, well, um, one of the questions that, uh, that I often get on the, uh, on, on the heartburn uh, thing is, does this also apply to Pepsid uh, and that kind of drug? And the answer is no. And the difference is that these, these powerful drugs, the, um, the Nexiums of the world, they reduce your stomach acid for 24 hours at a time, whereas the Pepsid just reduces the stomach acid around the time you're eating. So... Pepsid is okay, Tums are fine. It's just, you, you don't wanna, I mean, you know, you, you got, you've got acid in your stomach for a reason. You don't wanna be fooling around with it. Um, okay, so survey says. Spine, once again, this is a very literate audience that you have here. Spine is in fact the correct answer. And if we go to the next slide, um, now, this was reported that there was a, uh, a conference and people were asked for a, a show of hands and whether they would themselves, a conference of back surgeons, get a spinal fusion. And it was reported that 99% of them said no. Now, I have, to, I have to add that no one has actually, this has been reported many times, no one has actually said which conference and gotten a primary source. But one thing I can tell you for sure is that um, there are a lot of problems with spine surgery. Uh, the number one indication for a spinal fusion may very well be sp failed spinal fusion. It's either number one or number two. It's very, very high. If you look at folks who have them, within five years, 10% needed another operation. Within 10 years, people were reporting a lot of problems and getting physical deterioration. Within 15 years, 37% needed another operation. So this is an absolute last resort. I mean, I know people say it's a last resort. It's even more of a last resort than people are saying that it is. Once again, educate your employees that just because it's healthcare doesn't mean it's good for you. Hey, Alice, we're moving on to the next question. I wanna make sure that you talk about chiropractic as an alternative. So keep that as you introduce the next question. Let's use that one. Okay, that's yes. That, that would be a great thing to come back to during this poll. Um, so next question is, how does the radiation in a CAT scan compare to the radiation in an X-ray? More than 100 times as much, 5 to 50 times as much, 
about the same or it's a different technology altogether, which is why doctors recommend them over x-rays. Uh, now, to, as for alternatives to back surgery, there are many alternatives. Uh, you know, I, I myself uh, went to a chiropractor for years and years and found it very useful, but then I purchased one of those rollers. You know, I actually used the metal ones with the, the, the hollow ones with the rubber on it, and it, 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 it's, as, it's, as, it's a chiropractor. Um, but you know, some people get relief of acupuncture, uh, others get uh, functional medicine. Uh, the thing about these, um, these, these back therapy, uh, back problems is kind of no two of them are alike. So you can't say this is the solution. What you can certainly say is this other thing is your last choice. So there are your choices and survey says, wow. This is, I do these things all the time. This is the first time I've ever seen the majority get the right answer three times in a row. It is indeed more than a hundred times as much. Uh, and if you probably noticed, they don't tell you that. Um, they, they, they don't tell you that um, when you get the scan. And then you think about a scan, you think, oh, you know, oh, it's a scan. So I'm, I'm scanning the horizon right now. The horizon is none the worse off for my scanning it, right? No, these things are full of radiation. A CAT scan, if you can imagine a whole lot of little x-rays being taken all at the same time as you pass through and then the computer makes uh, cross-sectional images out of them, that's, that's a lot of x-rays that you're getting. And while we're on the subject, um, choosing wisely, I, I left the choosing wisely link there for that. Uh, but the very, very specific thing to keep in mind is the fastest growing category of CAT scans is children. And children are the last people you want to get uh, radiation on because their cells are still dividing and also going to live a long time. So uh, any shock, any radiation shock to the shell, cell has a long time to uh, mess with the DNA there. Uh, so just avoiding, just, just Educating patients on this um, means that they're less likely to go in and demand inappropriate medical care. So the next question is, what should you do if your kid has a cavity in a baby tooth? And your choices are to get it filled, even though it will be very traumatic, ask the dentist to spray magic juice, paren SDF, on it, Use general anesthesia so your child is unaware of what's happening or wait for the baby tooth to fall out. And while we're on that... And Al, while we're waiting, I was going to say we had a question that came in about MRIs. So yes. how, how do those compare to CAT scans? Uh, that's a great question. MRIs are not based on radiation, so they do not have radiation in them. They're the two major risks of MRIs that people are not as aware of are one that if you get the contrast dye, it's called gadolinium, um, and a lot of MRIs have it, makes a sharper image, it gets lodged in your brain. It does not flush out. Now, before you panic, no one has actually been able to trace, except for people who had certain conditions to begin with, gadolinium in your brain to any kind of health problem down the road. Nonetheless, it's a good thing to know about before you get an MRI. And the second thing, Robin, is um, that, and we have a, I think we might have a question on this. Oh, that might, I, I do these things all the time. I think actually it was last night. They, they, uh, they can give you a ton of misdiagnoses. And in fact, they sent a, a patient, some researchers got a grant and they sent a patient to 10 different imaging centers. And the patient came back with 49 different diagnoses. No two imaging centers were the same. And the actual thing that the person had, which had been surgically found, only showed up on like six of the 10. So you cannot assume that just because it's an MRI, it's right. So that's a great question. Uh, wait for the baby tooth to fall out is the answer from the panel. And eh. okay, we did get a few answers with ask the dentist to spray magic juice on it, which is incredibly the correct answer. Now you might say, what the H-E double tooth fix? Well, it is the case. And I will, um, it takes a sec to advance the slide, I think for some, hang on a sec. There we go. It is the case. Um, you can 
Google on silver diamine fluoride, which is SDF, which was in the question, and you will find articles like this. We just did a big blog post on it uh, because it, it is something that essentially obsoletes uh, two thirds of all cavities that dentists drill and it only costs a tiny fraction of what dentists charge. So shockingly, dentists are not racing to embrace this. You need to ask for it. We got some amazing statistics from Delta Dental of Arizona, which, is, which started covering it. They're the first, I mean, it's been FDA approved since 2014. It's been used in Japan since 1970. Nobody's found anything wrong with it. But the dentist, I mean, my own dentist uh, wouldn't let me do it. But, I mean, I had to insist. So, so she says, um, I, I, had a, I had a little cavity because, you know, one of the things you learn from Quizify is that you don't need to get these bite wings all the time or even a lot of the time unless you have a root canal. Because if you have a root canal with a crown over it, you can't feel the decay. So it's very important to check uh, uh, to get bite wings if you have a root canal. So I had a root, I had a root canal and I actually asked her for a bite wing. Normally I wouldn't have gotten one uh, scheduled. And sure enough, there was a little bit of decay. So she said, okay, well, we'll make an appointment to have this, um, you know, this uh, taken care of. And I said, well, why don't we just uh, put SDF on it? And she said, quote unquote, you know, that stuff's not a miracle. And I said, well, I think it's indicated here. She said, well, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to turn the decay black, which in fact it does. In fact, I think that's on the next slide. Turn, it says, turn your teeth black. It turns the decay black. And I said, number one, that it's under a crown. The decay is under a crown, so nobody's going to see it. Number two, even if somebody were going to see it, I'm already married. I don't care if somebody sees a little black spot on one of my back teeth. So you've got to teach employees to insist on this. And in fact, we just, we, anybody who wants uh, can go to our website, quizify.com. We just put a blog post on this because as I mentioned, one of the deltas is finally starting to covering it. They've overcome the dental resistance. It only costs like 30 bucks. And now it only costs 15 bucks in, in Arizona because it's being covered. And the funny thing is the dentist, if you read this article that I'll happily send you if you write to me or you can find on the website, uh, from the dentistry today, uh, they quote a whole bunch of dentists and one of them says, oh yeah, we use it all the time, but we only use it in patients who can't pay, uh, you know, for, for uh, patients who are uninsured, indigent, et cetera, who can't pay to have their cavities uh, drilled and filled. This may be the only case in all of healthcare where poor people get much better care than rich people do. And then, uh, and then another dentist is quoted saying, yeah, I see a lot of seniors in my practice and seniors like the fact that this is very low cost and it's painless and it only takes a few minutes. And he said it, the quote is in such a way that somehow the rest of us who aren't seniors don't mind spending a lot of money, spending a lot of time in the chair and getting Novocaine and, uh, and drilling. Hey, Al, one of our attendees mentioned that he knew the answer to this quiz because your blog post popped up on one of his feeds recently. So not only do we want to educate our members about making good choices, but we want to make sure that the thought leadership is getting to brokers, consultants, vendors, and employers so that they're aware of what they should be educating members to do differently. So keep that up. Thank you, Robin. And, and yes, a lot of what we're talking about here is just free for the asking. I mean, you can just take that blog post and you can just send it out. Uh, and uh, the value add that Quizify has is we have actually whole quizzes on this stuff. Uh, we have, uh, you know, whole quizzes on dental health. We call it an, an amalgam of dental questions. So, so the group on this uh, Zoom is paying for thousands of kids' cavities every year, and two-thirds of them can be treated this way, and adults can be treated this way, too. I mean, I literally, I had to get all my teeth replaced, actually, because it turned out that, that a lifetime of drinking orange juice wore away all the uh, dentin. But, um, but I had it in my mouth, and it worked just fine. Uh, the dentists uh, do resist, um, but just as long as you, you know your facts. Okay, next question. Now, we've given some choosing wisely. We've given a dental. Uh, now we're just going to do a lifestyle question. Which popular milk is best for reducing diabetes risk? Is it low-fat or skim, whole, almond, or soy? And um, while you're uh, uh, 
while people are waiting on that, do we have any other questions? Because I had one that came up. I didn't have a question. Why don't you go ahead with yours? Oh, okay. So the, the, the question about the silver diamond fluoride is, uh, are you saying that there's a conspiracy among dentists uh, not to, um, you know, not to let people <laughs> know about this? And the answer is yes. <laughs> no, all you have to do. And, and by the way, I am not a conspiracy theorist. I, you know, Oswald acted alone, you know, that kind of thing. I, I'm fine with that, right? This, you just have to read this article on dentistry today, and you'll see that, I mean, dentists have known about this stuff for years. And I know about it. I'm not even a dentist. I've known about this for five years. But if you've invested all this money in your practice, and you've seen it, you go in there, it's a very, the dentist practice is very high-tech things. You spent, you were four years of dental school, you probably spent 30 or 40% of that time filling cavities. If someone comes along and says, here's a bottle of stuff that makes all that obsolete, you know, you're not going to say, cool, you know, you're going to resist. It's, it's human nature. Okay, so we have an answer here. The answer, the winning answer is almond. Well, I'm afraid the streak, which was already broken, is not going to be unbroken because, in fact, the minority that said whole is correct. Uh, whole is the answer. As we say in milk, whole is the new skim. So uh, what they found is a, is a few things. Uh, one is that the, the, that the presence of fat in milk causes the sugar in milk to spike much more slowly in your blood. It's like a buffer. The second thing they found is that um, the, the, the particular saturated fat in milk, and I can't remember the name of it, it's something obscure, but uh, actually it by itself um, is a retardant of diabetes. So they're really two very different effects that make whole milk a much better bet for diabetes avoidance than skim milk. It does have a few more calories in it, obviously, but, um, but specifically for diabetes, it's the way to go. Now, almond milk, one, let's look at what the headlines say about almond milk. Lay off the almond milk, you ignorant hipsters. Almond milk comes in dead last of ranking of milky fluids. Now, you might say, um, you might say well, wait a sec. Uh, you know, it doesn't have any sugar in it. Um, well, it, first of all, it's full of sugar. And second, you can actually get it without sugar. They sell it without sugar. I don't know if you ever taste it. It doesn't taste very good. And in the question itself, we said, which popular milk? is best for reducing diabetes risk. And there's nothing about uh, almond milk without sugar that could be called popular. Um, now, what we've been able to do is get um, certain wellness vendors to actually update their health risk assessments. So you might wanna check yours because a lot of them are still saying like this one says, make healthier choices, dairy products, uh, low fat or fat free milk, low fat or non fat yogurt, um, so uh, check your HRA. I, I, we've gotten a lot of them to switch, but you know we don't want to be saying the opposite of what uh, what they're saying. It's good to have everyone align. Uh, here's a trivia question: We're not even going to put up the screen, that, which is kind of a head scratcher, given that this is uh, a, a wellness health risk assessment. What makes non-fat yogurt taste good? You can say it, Robin or Joanne. Sugar. Sugar. Yes. So. This, this particular HRA is telling people basically to eat more sugar. So, so what about answer. what about uh, Greek yogurt though? Because I oh, eat good stuff. Greek yogurt. Yeah. So so here's a rule of thumb, Robin. That's that's a great question. Um, that's a great question. And a, a good rule of thumb is a packaged good in a store, which yogurt would count as, if it is sweet, uh, it is sweetened with some kind of sugar. There are something like 61 different kinds of sugar. The Greek yogurt tends to have a lot of flavor on its own and it's not sweet. Now, some people have figured out a way to take Greek yogurt and make it sweet. You know, so you, you still have to read the label, but the, you know, the, the regular old Greek yogurt is one of the healthiest things in the world for you. All right, good to know. Now, speaking of reading the labels and sugars, and that was a good segue, Robin. Thank you for that. Um, here is a very popular uh, granola bar, very healthy looking granola bar. And the question is, how many mentions of sugars are there in this granola bar? And this time, don't, don't put up the polling question quite yet because we want people to take a, a quick look at this. Is it going to be A, 2? If, well, if you think it's 2, write A. If you think it's 4, put B. If you think it's 6, put C. And if you think it's D, put 10. 
and we'll just leave it up for a, uh, for a second, and we'll actually use that second. We're doing fine time-wise. So we'll actually use that second to um, go back to the yogurt thing. A good rule of thumb in yogurts is if you recognize the brand name from when you were a kid, it's full of sugar. Okay, so, and the chances are, if you don't recognize the brand name, it's probably fine. But once again, you got to read the label and you got to look for these synonyms for sugar too. And like I say, there's 61 of them. Um, so now I think we've given people a little bit of time to, um, to read the label. So um, why don't you put the polling up? Um, you don't have a polling question for this one. Oh, we don't. Okay. So, uh, well, the answer is, uh, is 10. Um, and there they are. And, and this is a very useful question for uh, a, a bunch of reasons. Uh, one that is a theme of Quizify and should be a theme of whatever employee education you do and by, is that number one, the food companies will um, list the healthy ingredients first and then they will, as we sometimes say, sprinkle the sugars throughout the ingredients label uh, so you don't notice it because they know people basically look at the first ingredient. Uh, number two, there are, I think I mentioned the 61 different synonyms for sugar. Some of them sound very healthy, like turbinado or agave, or the one that um, Cliff Bars start out with, which is uh, organic whole, uh, organic brown rice syrup. The, the words organic and brown rice sound very healthy, but anytime you see the word syrup, it's sugar. I don't care what words come before it. Um, Sometimes it looks like, like grape juice concentrate. Oh, cool, grapes. No, grape juice concentrate is you've taken all the good stuff out and what's left is, is sugar. And the other thing that we teach is that granola bars are candy. Uh, and then finally, beware of long ingredients labels. Uh, nothing good ever came out of a long ingredients label. Uh, now, uh, this is good because it's a good type of question, a good type of quiz, because it's a good complement to your health risk assessment. Now, your health risk assessment teach employees to avoid added sugar. Like this one says, avoid added sugar. Well, that's, that's helpful information. It's, it's correct information, but it's not particularly useful unless you also point out where the added sugars are. Uh, and that's what a, a, a good educational quiz can do. And by the way, this particular one, which is also a very um, popular one, says avoid adding extra fats and oils when preparing food at the, or at the table. Honestly, that's probably not the best advice. I mean, there's certainly fats and, oil, fats and oils that are quite healthy. Okay, so we're back to choosing wisely now. According to the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and choosing wisely, how often should most people in the working age population get checkups? Your choices are annual checkups are specifically not recommended by choosing wisely, every five years, twice in your 20s, three times in your 30s, four times in your 40s, five times in your 50s, and annually after that, or annually. And- uh, Hey, Al, while folks, are, while folks are answering, I wanted to uh, ask a question about the ingredients. One of our attendees asked, are the ingredients listed in the order of density in the product? So the, the one that has the most content within the product is listed first? Yes, that's correct. And that's why they figured out, like, if you read uh, a lot of sugars, for instance, if you look at General Mills isn't a sponsor, right? <laughs> so I can say it. Cool. So no, they're not. At, if you look at a General Mills cereal, and it will say on the side panel, it will say whole grains are our number one ingredient, which is true. And uh, but if you read the ingredients label, they have, in fact, taken all the sugars and instead of just putting sugar in, they've got brown sugar here, they've got regular sugar here, they've got honey here, they've got corn syrup there. So those all appear in much lower quantity. So that's a, that's a great question. Okay, awesome. Okay, so uh, the uh, survey says, okay, so we have, uh, it looks like one or two votes for uh, annual and every five years. And then the twice in your 20s, et cetera, and annually uh, uh, took the, uh, the, the, the majority popular opinion. The answer is annual checkups are specifically not recommended by choosing wisely. Uh, now, before you get upset with me, don't shoot me here. I'm just the messenger, okay? 
this is not me talking. This is, this is not just choosing wisely, I might add. This is um, literally every study which has measured uh, annual checkups on healthy people. And you might say, well, what about unhealthy people? Well, they, they should be going to the doctor more often for sure, but that's not what an annual checkup is. An annual checkup is there's nothing wrong with you. Should you be going to the doctor anyway? So this is choosing wisely. It is important to have a regular doctor who helps make sure you receive the medical care that is best for your individual needs, but healthy people often don't need annual physicals and they can even do more harm than good Here's why. Now here's the New England Journal of Medicine editorializing against the annual physical. And mind you, these are people who make their money on annual physicals, telling you you probably don't need one if you're healthy. Journal of the American Medical Association. Health checks, meaning uh, routine physicals, may be associated with more diagnoses and more drug treatment. Um, and then it says they were not associated with uh, lower rates of all case mortality, morbidity, et cetera. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the right answer according to choosing wisely is A, they are not recommended. Now, that is the answer, the, the way the question was written. We have two better answers that, uh, that, that we might propose that you consider. Uh, one is the one that in fact was the second most, or a tied for the most popular, which is twice in your 20s and so on. This is the one that Quizify recommends, and this is the one that carries the uh, Harvard Medical School seal because it's a good balance between um, what people's intuition is, hey, I need to go every year, uh, and what the actual answer is, which is, you know, you, you don't. And it, it kind of aligns up, lines up with likely health problems that people might have. The best answer of all is, to, it's different for everybody. So if you require a form from the doctor to prove that an employee's got a physical, add a line to that form where the doctor says, schedule your next physical for 2020 whatever. Might be 2021, 2022, 2025 in my case. Um, and give the employee credit. You know, they got to waive their HIPAA rights, but no one's going to mind waiving their HIPAA rights to get credit for that. So don't pay employees or urge them and stuff to, to get physicals that their own doctor and choosing wisely says they don't need. Go with what the doctor says. One size does not fit all because it creates false positive stress and oh, by the way, you're paying for it. According to choosing wisely, how often should most non-insulin dependent diabetics check their glucose? Less than once a day, once a day, twice a day, or more than twice a day? And Al, while folks are answering this quiz, I just want to provide you with some questions and feedback coming in through the Q&A. Um, I think that there was a bit of outrage based on your first response to the question. Um, and, I, and I think that we're kind of answering it, but what I'm hearing is it's important for people to monitor and be aware of their health risks and have a relationship with a primary care doctor. And that's really what's more important than having an annual physical. Would you agree? Uh, that's what I would say. That's what Choosing Wisely says. Uh, yes, um, absolutely. But yes, people still need to know their health risks. And so if an employer isn't encouraging an annual physical, they should definitely be creating a vehicle to promote and reward people for knowing their numbers and managing those health risks. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to do uh, both is absolute overkill, but one or, one or the other is still plenty. So uh, glucose check question. Um, and the answer is once a day, one, uh, twice a day, more than twice a day, less than once a day. Let's see what Choosing Wisely says. Okay, now remember, once again, I'm just the messenger, okay? Um, Choosing Wisely says less than once a day. Uh, this is their exact quote, you know, send your hate mail to them, okay? So <laughs> daily finger glucose testing has no benefit in patients with type 2 diabetes who are not on insulin or medications associated with hyperglycemia, and small but significant patient harms are associated with daily glucose testing. It should be reserved for patients during the titration of their medication doses or during periods of changes in patients' diet and exercise routine. So once again, just like the physicals, it's not one size fits all. Some people should probably be doing twice a day or more, but plenty of people are more likely to be harmed by even doing it once a day. So teach this to your employees, your, 
doctor should be saying this. Um, certainly this is what Quizify says. Now, uh, in the interest of time, um, we probably should skip right to the last uh, question and then we'll have a few minutes for Q&A before the cash prize begins. Okay, so did you learn something today about how to choose wisely, live wisely, or spend wisely? Now, of course, I'm not allowed to vote. They're not allowed to vote, so this is going to be a real poll, and I'm quite exposed here. Uh, hopefully, we'll get 80%. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Survey says, do I want to know this? Um, some people are still voting. Oh, some people are still voting. Okay. okay. And when oh, we come back, score. we're going to talk about something score. else. Okay. All right, so um, let's leave the slide up for a while. Robin, we have a few minutes for Q&A before the cash prize quiz begins. Yeah, so let's start by talking a little bit about comorbidity. So the last question before this, you were talking about diabetes again. And let's talk a little bit about folks who are comorbid risk for diabetes, heart disease, and Alzheimer's. How would you then perhaps change your response regarding recommending whole milk? if you're also considering heart disease and Alzheimer's, is your answer still the same? Uh, you know, that's a great question. And, it's, and at some point, you know, since I don't even play a doctor on TV, I, I gotta say, go with what your doctor says. Um, because you're, you're, you know, the, 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 the interns have a very difficult time as patients do themselves when they have comorbidities where when you manage one, it makes another worse. So one of the things you have to learn when you're writing these trivia questions is when to step back and admit you don't know the answer. Yeah, I, I have another question about sugars. So I am a non-sweetened almond milk drinker. I put that in my coffee only. I agree, it doesn't taste good on its own, but it's fine in coffee. I don't care for sweeteners, especially artificial sweeteners and stevia. But when you think about sugars, what is your point of view on artificial sweeteners and things like stevia that are no calorie, but make things taste sweet? Okay, now that's a, once again a great question, and uh, there's a reason that we don't put it in this particular quiz where we want everything to be sort of, you know, very clear yes or no, is that it's a very controversial question, you know, how bad are artificial sweeteners versus sugar, and uh, where we are, where the, the Harvard folks that we work with are, is as between the two, you probably prefer artificial sweeteners, okay, you just don't want to you just don't want to have nothing but, you know, I mean, there's essentially there's nothing that's made in a factory that you want to do, eat a whole bunch of. Uh, but we know the hazards of sugar are bad. We think there are hazards of uh, artificial uh, sweeteners that are pretty bad, but they're, they, it would have, they'd have to be really bad before they were as bad as sugars. Okay. So uh, I think- I'm not, I'm not a fan. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan either. Um, so we have time for uh, one more question before people have to uh, jump on. And if, if you wanna, um, I'll stop sharing. If you wanna just put the uh, link up um, one more time. Yeah, and I wanna remind folks that you received an email this morning. If you haven't already accessed the quiz, you can go back to your email to do that. So a lot of the work that we do on the Health and Productivity Committee, Al, is really around keeping people out of the healthcare system. So are there any other topics or specific activities that you might recommend that we haven't talked about today that can keep people from accessing healthcare and thus help have a positive impact on the cost of healthcare for Rhode Island employers? Well, you know, Rhode Island is, uh, is a state, I mean, I go there all the time. I just live right up the road in Massachusetts that has all sorts of outdoor, you know, nine month a year opportunities. And I hate to sound like a cliche, but if exercise were a pill, it would be the most valuable pill in the world. And some is better, a little is better than none, some is better than a little, a lot's probably better than some, as long as you're not obsessed with it. So I know that, I, I hate to end on kind of a cliche, but there's a reason it's a cliche, it's because it's the right answer. Um, right, well, and luckily during the COVID pandemic worldwide, they've seen only a slight decrease in footstep tracking activity. So it means that even though um, our lives are really different right now, people are still getting exercise, but I'm sure there's always the opportunity to get more and to see an improvement there. So I like that recommendation. Everybody can do it. 
Yes, and that's it's a good one to end on with a lot of consensus, given the one we asked about the uh, about the physicals. So uh, now people should uh, jump onto the quiz, and we will be announcing the winners of the gift certificates probably ten or fifteen minutes after the quiz closes. Uh, anyone who doesn't want to jump on the quiz who has a, a Q and A they want to ask, uh, I'm happy to stick around. I mean, it's not like I'm going anywhere. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention we just got a comment from one of our attendees um, saying great recommendation around physical activity. You know, it's, I think it's hard that when people are thinking about their total well being and trying to take into consideration um, some of the top risks worldwide right now, 75% uh, of people are struggling financially. Um, we're seeing significant increases in mental health suicide, substance use disorders. I think, you know, people are really struggling in this 2020 roller coaster. I think people want off. And so, um, you know, trying to get folks out and, and keep them physically active in a, in a distanced environment, not socially distant, but physically distanced environment to help keep them safe um, is, is a great way to help overcome some of those challenges. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to cost any money. Um, and, and pretty much everybody has a way to, to move. So a couple other questions are coming in. So first, um, you know, to build off of the conversation that I just introduced, do you have any mental health recommendations to help people manage stress, anxiety, et cetera? You know, uh, with Quizify, and for, I, I'm flattered that people would, would think that I would. So thank you very much for that. But with Quizify, we're mostly about very factual things. And there's I, and there's certain things about mental health, like exercise actually does improve your mental health. That is not a myth. And we also educate employees about the EAPs and virtually everyone on this call has an EAP and I would bet you that half their employees don't know about it. But mental health, for, and then we educate on signs of depression, but mental health doesn't really lend itself to the type of uh, sort of Q&A format uh, that we use. But it's a good question. I wish I could give it a better answer. Well, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to add that to the list of potential topics for a future health and productivity committee event because um, it's an area that we've been focusing on in a variety of ways over the years. So maybe you have a point of view on a Know Your Numbers campaign. Uh, yes, I do. And it may not be that popular. In fact, that was the last question that because of time we had to sk skip over. If you look at the Choosing Wisely recommendations, um, once again, this is not a one size fits all recommendation that they make. They say if you have, uh, if you do not have risk factors, you can check your, your, your uh, glucose and your cholesterol uh, every several years. Um, and it, even less often if you're in your 20s, if you do have risk factors, follow the schedule that your doctor tells you to check these things. But the idea that everyone has to know their numbers every year is, you know, if it were free and you knew that the data that you were getting was correct and you knew that people were going to act on it, it would be a good idea. But it's not free and there's a lot of uh, false positives and the people that you really need to act on it often don't act on it. So I would say you'd want to really focus the campaign on people who really have the risk factors, not spread across every employee. I mean, I, 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 my, my wife's uh, employer has a, has a wellness program. I collect my $100 every year, and they're, they're not going to save a nickel on me. You know, they're wasting their time. Yeah, well, you know what? I feel the same way about Know Your Numbers campaigns, because when I work with organizations, I will often suggest, yes, we could do that once, but we don't want to do it every year. And I'm a perfect example like you. I love to stop and get my blood pressure checked because I've got good blood pressure. So it gives me positive reinforcement. But for people who know they're at risk, there can be some element of, yeah, I already know it, or they may have some feeling of shame or discomfort around going through it. Um, and so I think that those relationships with your doctor, once you've had that baseline, would definitely be much more effective than just doing a an annual Know Your Numbers campaign. I agree. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and actually, that, that's, a, that's a really great point that I didn't mention about that one baseline. Uh, and the reason that's specifically important, and I think you would put many resources into that and then very little after that, is that one out of every two or 300 people has what's known as familial hypercholesterolemia, where even basically you know, uh, an Easter egg hunt is going to make their cholesterol go up. You know, so they, 
they, uh, they are very high risk, uh, whereas the rest of the population, the younger population, is not going to be at any risk at all. But finding that one person who's a walking time bomb is a very worthwhile activity. Yeah, and I think also um, taking the initiative and communicating that story through a testimonial or a newsletter um, helps to create that, that sense that we saved somebody's life. So employees then are recognizing that the program isn't punitive. It's here because our employer cares about us. Those are the things that employers really need to do um, to create that sense of stability and comfort that well-being is important. Not that we're here to judge you or to um, penalize you for unhealthy lifestyles. So, you know, really creating that positive environment around health can make a big impact on participation, I think. Well, it can. And unfortunately, the federal government looks like it's poised to go in exactly the other direction, uh, which is to green light. And this this should probably be another um, webinar that we do down the road to green light exactly the kind of punitive program that you're describing shouldn't be done uh, because the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the wellness industry lobbied the uh, I would say I won't say which party. One of the parties on the Equal Opportunity Employment Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uh, to give them the green light to do this, so that they could save a ridiculous amount of money on health care simply by denying it to people who are overweight. Yeah, and I do believe that more organizations will move towards an outcomes-based program, and I just actually predicted that on a webinar yesterday. And it's not because I'm suggesting that employers should shame or um, penalize employees for being unhealthy, but especially in light of a second or potential third wave of this pandemic going through, something like 90% of people who were hospitalized during COVID had a chronic condition. And many of those conditions were based on obesity, type 2 diabetes, you know, high blood pressure, et cetera. And so if they could help people to achieve and maintain a healthy weight, not only would it have a positive impact on those business outcomes, but it would also keep people safer in the event that they are exposed to another pandemic. But I think that there's a very slippery slope on how you communicate that, how you operationalize it to make sure that it is in the spirit of taking care of employees and not treating them like liabilities. You know, going from a very tight labor market to what may be a soft labor market in the future I think there are some employers that are going to start looking at their employees as liabilities, and they're going to be um, a bit more punitive than they have in the recent past. Well, they can reduce the uh, employee, uh, they can increase the employee share and reduce their own share by 30%. So that's thousands of dollars a year in a soft labor market, in a low profit market. That could be very attractive. It has been proven over and over again that that the outcomes based, everything you're saying is accurate. Uh, but the outcomes-based programs don't do anything about it. I mean, if it were as easy as as uh, financial incentives could cause you to lose weight, Oprah Winfrey would be size two, right? Because um, she's got she owns half a weight control Weight Watchers. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want yeah, to yeah. Well, no, I, I agree with you. I just want to add one other thing before um, you know we get the results in. Uh, even though the Health and Productivity Committee isn't sponsoring any more health and wellness or health and well-being um, webinars. RIBGH does have another webinar coming up on July 15th at noontime with um, Lynn Friedman talking about cybersecurity while working remotely from home. So um, that would be a great one for any business owner uh, and HR professional as we're sharing information online. People are you know, using home computers, et cetera, to tune into. Um, Lynn has an excellent presentation, something that is very worthwhile your time. And uh, thank you, Joanne, for helping to pull this together. And uh, we'll see you all again soon.